Hi everyone, this incident happened about 5 years ago. This is a story that I never really tell anymore because most people are either uncomfortable hearing it or make well-meaning comments about what I should have done in this situation without really understanding how differently your mind works when you're experiencing absolute panic. But you guys seem to get it. So here's my story. I was living in a relatively nice apartment in downtown Memphis, working as an ophthalmic technician. I arrived home from work at my usual time, around 4.30pm, unlocked my door, and went inside. I set my phone, wallet, and keys on the kitchen island, hearing my heavy metal front door swing shut loudly behind me, and began taking care of some errands around the house. Having grown up in a small town, it was a habit for me not to lock my door during the day, especially when I knew my husband would be home soon anyway. I've never forgotten to lock my door once in the five years since this day. I walked through my bathroom and into my large walk-in closet and began hanging up my laundry that I'd started earlier in the day before work. My front door opened and I smiled with a surprise. My husband was home a little bit early and I was happily calling out to him. I'm in here, love. I was met with silence, and slowly I began to feel that sinking feeling of something is wrong crawl up my spine. I tried to shake it off, thinking my husband simply hadn't heard me, and walked out into my living room slash kitchen area. Standing on the other side of my kitchen island was a complete stranger. He was male, older than me. I would estimate 50s but it's hard for me to recall exact facial features or details from this moment and was just standing there staring at me. No ski mask, no weapon, just watching me. I wonder if he had maybe walked into the wrong apartment and was going to apologize and leave, but as he continued to stare, I realized I needed to do something other than just gape at this stranger in my house. I stood taller, puffed up my chest in an attempt to look more threatening, which is hard to do as a small female, and used a loud, clear voice telling him to get out of my apartment that he had no business being here. He completely ignored me like I hadn't spoken. Then he began to pick up my things, my cell phone, my keys, my wallet. He picked them up methodically and put them into his own pockets. That's when it truly hit me that this person was dangerous. I was naive enough to believe this was all a mistake, until the moment I darted toward him, the only other device I had that would allow me to get help was my computer. I had to take a few steps closer to the intruder in order to reach it, but still had about 12 to 15 feet between us, so I knew I could grab it and run before he could reach me. As I picked it up and turned to run, I saw him start to move after me and I sprinted back up toward the bathroom because it was the only place I could go to and put two locked doors between us, my bathroom door and the closet door. I slammed and locked the first door, and within seconds I could hear him messing with it, trying to open it. I ran into the closet and locked the door too, opening my computer and getting on Facebook Messenger to contact my husband. I sent message after message pleading with him to call 911 and tell them there was an intruder in the apartment. He got the messages within minutes and assured me that they had a dispatcher on the phone and was leaving work himself to try and get to me if he could. I waited and waited. The bathroom door opened and the intruder came inside. He moved to the closet door and started trying to break that door down too. Here's the part where people usually start giving me advice on how I should have acted but all I can tell you is that I was frozen, with fear, with shock, I don't know, but I didn't scream, cry, or search for a weapon in that dark closet, I didn't brace the door or try to hold it closed, I just kneeled in my closet and waited to die, because I just knew that's what was going to happen. People like to tell me that I lived in an apartment, surely if I'd scream somebody would have heard and come to help me, surely. There was something heavy enough in my closet to use to defend myself. Heck, even the laptop I had would hurt if I swung it at someone. Why didn't I do anything? I don't really have an answer for that, but the closet door, miraculously, held. 
I heard frustrated footsteps go back out into the living room area of my apartment. I heard things breaking, bottles shattering, my drawers and refrigerator cabinets being flung open as if things were being thrown out of them. I continued to sit in that closet, silently crying, wanting to leave but feeling that death was coming. I feel awful about my selfishness in that moment, but I messaged my mom, who lived a 15 hour drive away and told her what was happening. I desperately wanted comfort and to tell her how much I loved her. Now I'm not a parent myself, but I can only imagine the fear and helplessness I put her through knowing that her daughter was in danger and there was nothing that she could do to help me. She messaged me constantly, begging me to keep replying. I told her I would as long as I could, but I also told her to tell my brothers how much I loved them, to help my husband through whatever happened next if it ended badly for me. The intruder started messing with the closet door again, mumbling disjointed words that I couldn't really distinguish. I remember hoping that the police would get to the apartment before my husband, that he wouldn't be the one to find me in whatever state this invader left me in. The front door opened again, and it was my husband, shouting for me. The intruder walked toward the living room slash kitchen area again, where my front door was located, and I opened the door and darted from the closet to find my husband on the ground with him, pinning him in place. The man kept mumbling, at times yelling, but never really put up much resistance. This entire part is a blur for me. I remember feeling like the room was spinning, filled with fear, mostly for my husband at this point. Eventually, the police found the apartment. It took them about 25 minutes to arrive, which still blows my mind. I know time seems to move slowly during scary situations, so I thought it was less than that. But from the time my husband dialed 911 to the time officers arrived, it was 25 minutes. This isn't intended to bash them in any way. It just always seemed like this was an unusually long response time for a home invasion. They got my things back from the man and took him out of my apartment. I numbly went through the process of filing a police report telling them exactly what happened. One of the police officers commented that I should really keep my door locked at all times. I remember feeling like he was being insensitive at the time or blaming me for what happened but later recognized his words were coming from experience. I'm sure he's seen this situation end differently for other women. Within 30 minutes, the scariest incident in my life was over, but I've carried the fear, the violation, the anxiety of having someone intrude into my space for years. If it happened to me once, it could happen again. If you made it this far in the story, thanks for listening. Please consider continuing because this isn't all doom and gloom. If this or something similar has happened to you and you're still struggling with the aftermath of it, the sleepless nights, the laying awake listening for sounds of forced entry, the nightmares, the constant checking and rechecking your locks, this is what eventually helped me. A year after this took place, my husband and I moved to the Midwest for his job. We selected a safe town with a nice apartment complex and chose a third floor apartment with only one entry point. I looked up every statistic on crime for the neighborhood, finding that an isolated incident of car theft was the only thing reported in decades. I still couldn't sleep at night though. It was definitely better than staying in the same apartment in Memphis, but my husband often works night shifts now and I simply couldn't continue being terrified to sleep at night. I realized my biggest fear wasn't that something could happen again, but that if it did, I was just as unprepared now as I was then. I hadn't changed anything other than locking my door, and I knew I would likely freeze up again and leave my life up to being able to hide well enough or having a door hold long enough to save me, and that was unacceptable. I walked into a martial arts school with an excellent self-defense program, introduced myself, and started taking classes. At first, I was quiet, hiding in the back of the room and generally keeping to myself. My instructor, who was both incredibly kind and incredibly insightful, slowly built up my confidence and brought me out of my bubble of fear. After several months of training, 
I finally shared my reason for taking classes with him and he's worked with me tirelessly to give me the ability to protect myself in any environment. I've been training for years now and the difference it has made in every aspect of my life is unbelievable. The meek, quiet girl that waited to die in her closet doesn't exist. I am confident. I am strong. I am worthy of living and protecting myself in my home. I no longer am ashamed of how I handled the situation I was in, but I also understand what steps I can take to ensure that I'm safe. It wasn't easy, and it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth it. I recognize this might not be a solution or option for everyone. Your experience is valid, and however you decide to cope with your own story is the right choice for you. This is how I happen to do it, and it's worked well for me. Thank you again for listening. Admittedly, I am a little bit afraid to share this because I'm not sure how people are going to respond, but maybe doing so will help someone else that's feeling alone with this. If anyone is struggling with their own story and wants a kind ear to listen, I'm here. Stay safe out there, everyone. So this happened to me a few years ago in April and I still can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. So I was home alone, getting ready for my 12 o'clock college class that morning, and I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I glanced out my window to see a man in his mid-thirties wearing a baseball cap roaming around my property with his hands on his hips, walking with a lot of weird confidence. Our yard is kind of like a cliff, and it looks over onto our five acres of property down below. I live in the PNW, so it's a pretty scenic view. I was really confused and thought maybe it was a worker that my mom had hired for our renovations on the house that was just admiring the view. I'm a little bit uncomfortable at this point because the dude walks to the side of my house, out of sight. I head upstairs to see him now roaming around my front yard and down my driveway, looking at things checking out my house, etc. He still hasn't seen me at this point. I call my dad and ask him if we had hired anyone to come by the house, and he says not that he knows of, and tells me he's going to call my mom and ask her, and then call me back. I'm waiting for the call when I notice the strange dude's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates, just parked parallel to my front door. The man still hasn't seen me and he's still wandering around, so I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system, and I armed it, so if he tried to break in, it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. Just then I get a call back from my dad saying that neither him nor my mom had hired anyone to come by today and that I needed to call our local police station immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs and called my city's police station. I explained to a woman on the other end what is happening, and she decided that she's not going to send an officer out and instead gives me a number to call their emergency dispatch line and told me to talk to them. I called the number she gave me and immediately... I get an automated message saying, Thank you for calling. My town's name, non-emergency hotline, inserted here. Nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. At this point, I'm really irritated because 15 minutes have already passed, and thus far, weird dude is still lurking around my house while I'm home alone. And apparently that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady I called at my local police department. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator, I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they would even alert officers near me to start heading toward my house. The whole thing seemed really weird. Nobody was in a hurry to have officers come up to my place when I was a younger girl home alone with a strange man. I asked the officer if I could stay in the line with her, after what seemed like forever, alerted police come to where I was, and she agreed to stay on the phone with me, and I went back upstairs to check on the weird guy. 
He's now sitting in his unplated Honda, either listening to a radio show extremely loudly or on a phone call with someone through his car. It was a very prominent loud male voice coming from his car. Then all of a sudden, I hear the tone you hear when somebody hangs up on you and the operator was no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling me back, so I picked it up. Instead, I was greeted by really creepy heavy breathing. I'm not sure who it was, but it really freaked me out. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point, but that phone call put me in panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator who already knew my situation and address before I could even explain it to her. She said the cops were on their way. 20 minutes had passed at that point. The dude is still here in his car, and the cops aren't. Keep in mind, I live in a smaller town, so there's no reason why it took the cops as long as it did for them to come down to me. Finally, this guy is leaving my driveway right as the cops pulled in, and they stop him and ask him a few questions. A cop then comes to my door and hands me a sketchy looking flyer saying, it was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a dude my mom had hired. Until of course, I realized it wasn't. I called my mom back and said, The cops told me it was just a landscaper that you hired and that he had an appointment. My mom replies with, I can assure you, we never hired a landscaper. We don't even need one. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. I've quibbled with the thought of publicly sharing my story for a while now. Recently, I've arrived at a place where I think the benefit of sharing outweighs the risk. People can be so judgmental. So I'm taking a chance and I'm just putting it out there. Maybe it will help someone. Many times, I've looked back on the odd events leading up to the scariest night of my life, October 5th. 2015. I would like to say that I did everything correct, but honestly, in hindsight, I should have done more. I am convinced that my son, who was three and a half years old at the time, actually saved me from harm that night. I could have easily have become another statistic in the crime database. Although my stalker did not hurt me physically, it took me months to get past the psychological damage caused. Here is my story. All names have been changed, for obvious reasons. In May 2012, I temporarily exited the workforce following the birth of my son, Chris. He was born with a physical birth defect that would require multiple corrective surgeries during his first year of life. He was also born two and a half months early, which had complicated things further, and ICUs are no fun. Chris's father, Aaron, agreed that I should stay home with her son until he turned one year old, considering the circumstances at hand. In May 2013, I felt comfortable enough to leave my son with a babysitter, so I myself went job hunting. I ended up being hired on the spot as a waitress at a small but very popular chain restaurant in my little town. Let's just say that this little diner is widely known for their waffles, and we'll leave it at that. I was hired on to work second shift, the newbie shift, because it's not as busy. After two months, I'd worked my way up to first shift, the breakfast shift, is the money maker. By the summer of 2014, I had long built of a clientele of regular customers that enjoyed my service and tipped me well. Enough for me to have a little put back in savings, which came in handy when Aaron and I broke up. It was not an amicable split at first. 
I ended up moving out of our apartment with Chris and renting a small two-bedroom trailer in the same town. It was mid-November of 2014 when I first met Ryan, the man who would later stalk me. It was an abnormally slow Saturday morning shift at the diner. Two men, one late 40s, early 50s, the other maybe early 20s, walked into the diner together and sat down in my section. They were my only customers at the time, so when the older man of the two started making small talk, I had the time. The older man introduced himself to me as Ryan, and the younger man with him was his son. Right away, by his body language and tone, I could tell Ryan was being flirtatious with me. He even cracked a cliché joke by saying, There's no way you work here because you're too pretty and you have all your teeth. Honestly, I wasn't super amused with that tired kind of humor. I had heard it a million times over by then. And while Ryan was decent in the looks department, I'd even venture to say semi-attractive. I was a little annoyed with being casually hit on by him. I was 25 years old at the time, and much closer to his son's age. But nevertheless, I faked merriment because a happy customer equals a better tip. It's just part and parcel to the job. Suffice to say, my fake laughing and smile paid off, earning me a $10 tip on a $20 ticket. They were only there for 30 minutes too. Not bad, I thought to myself. The following weekend, Ryan came back to the diner, this time, and every subsequent time thereafter, he came alone. There was nothing unusual about this interaction than from the last time. I took his order, we chit-chatted when I had time, I kept his coffee refilled, and that was it. But apparently he enjoyed his experience, because again, he left me a nice $12 tip on an $8 ticket. Ryan began visiting the diner every weekend from then on, up until the end of December. By then, he had started coming two to three times per week, and at this point, he really started showing an interest in getting to know me. Now, that's not something unusual per se. I had some other regulars that I actually developed friendships with, some even getting me Christmas gifts and such. So I did tell him things about myself in casual conversation during his visits, just normal things that normal people talk about. One of the things I eventually told them about was the medical miracle that is my son. I even bragged about the fantastic job his doctors did, showing him the before and after photos of his surgeries. Over those past several weeks, Ryan's attitude toward me had changed. He was no longer this annoying, flirty middle-aged guy, but rather a seemingly caring person. Maybe I was naive but I genuinely appreciated his kindness and I did not interpret it as a romantic gesture at all. Ryan continued coming by on my shifts for breakfast three times a week. February 2015 is when the first strange event occurred, which was soon followed by a string of more. It was a Tuesday afternoon. I had picked Chris up from the babysitter and was heading home from work. Now, where I live was on a small uphill, dead-end road. As you pulled onto my road from the main highway, you could easily see my trailer on the right side at the top of the hill. It was positioned perpendicular to the road, and the back side of it is visible as you drive up the road. As I eased my way up the hill, something immediately caught my eye. I could clearly tell my back door was open. I put the brakes on immediately and tried to figure out what to do. I literally never touched or unlocked that door much less opened it, so I knew something was off. A door is not going to unlock and open all by itself. So I ended up parking my car off the side of the road and calling Aaron. At this point we were on good terms and co-parenting our son very well. Aaron came straight over and checked out my trailer while I remained back in my vehicle with Chris. About five minutes after entering, he called me and told me it was all clear. Again small trailer. So I made my way up the hill, expecting to have been robbed or something, but nothing was missing. There was no damage to the door. So Aaron basically brushed things off saying that I must have forgotten to close the door or something. I knew better, but since there were no signs of breaking and entering, I let it go. 
Two days later, on Thursday, I come home from work, and the same thing. My back door is wide open. At this point, I know I'm not crazy. I know I locked the door. It didn't have a deadbolt, by the way. It just had a lock on the doorknob that you turn. I'd even tested it out that morning before work to make sure it was locked. So I called Aaron again. I stayed parked with Chris on the side of the road while he did another pass through my trailer. And again, nothing out of the ordinary except my open back door. A quick inventory showed that nothing was missing. I was nervous at this point, thinking that somebody had broken in twice, and Aaron disagreed. He attributed this problem to a faulty doorknob lock, which made no sense to me. He then went to Lowe's and purchased a type of heavy-duty swivel lock to install on the door that locked from the inside of my home. He wanted to put my mind at ease, at least. So while he installed the lock, I combed through my house. I mean, I literally spent hours after Aaron left inspecting every nook and cranny of my trailer. The outlets, my shower head, vents, my panty drawer, etc. I thought that maybe some freak had broken in and planted secret cameras since they didn't take anything. I didn't find anything amiss. So I let it go. Two days after that, so on Saturday afternoon, I'm off work, heading uphill on the road toward my driveway. My son is spending the weekend with his dad, so I have the house to myself that evening. A wave of relief washes over me as I see that my back door is still closed. Now, I don't know why I decided to do this, but something compelled me to actually inspect the door up close. I needed to also make sure that it wasn't tampered with. To my horror, I discovered that it had. There were pry marks along the edge of the door jam. I immediately went inside and unlocked the door so I could open it and inspect it further. The edge of the door was bent on the inside where the doorknob met the jam, but that damage wasn't there two days ago when Aaron installed the new lock. I deduced that someone had probably been using the credit card trick, or something similar, to easily break into the door since the way it locked was by the knob. When they figured out that that would no longer work, they tried to pry it open not knowing that a new lock was on the other side of the door. I'm thankful that lock held. At this point, I called the police and made a report. They basically told me there wasn't much they could do in this instance other than document the incident. They told me to call them if anything else happened. Needless to say, that wasn't satisfactory to me, but I didn't know what else to do. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping at home that night, so I ended up making the hour drive to my parents' house and crashing there. Nothing else happened for a little while. By March, I've been able to put February's events behind me and feel secure in my home again. I was working and going about life as usual. At this point, Ryan had begun visiting the diner five times a week. Oddly enough, he was there each shift that I worked. It became a running joke with the other waitresses, and in fun they teased me about having a stalker. I would soon find out just how true that actually was, because in April, things got weird. I came home from work one day to find my grass had been mowed. Now I usually paid a neighbor to do it for me since I didn't have a lawnmower. My yard was small, but maintaining it was a requirement of my lease agreement. My neighbor didn't charge much to mow it and he needed the extra cash, so it was a win-win. Now, I knew I hadn't asked my neighbor to mow recently, so I thought it was strange. I asked him if he went ahead and decided to do it anyway, and he said that he hadn't, so then I called my landlord and asked her if she had mowed my grass for some reason. The lease said if it reaches a certain height, then she would mow it and charge me for it. I knew my grass hadn't been high enough to warrant that, but it was the only plausible explanation. Of course, she said no. She hadn't mowed my grass. I was stumped. I then assumed that an anonymous neighbor must have mowed my grass out of the goodness of their heart. You know, like a pay it forward kind of thing. I mean, what else was I to think? All throughout April and the beginning of May, my grass was being anonymously mowed once per week. I know it sounds strange reading it, 
but at the time I genuinely thought a neighbor was just doing neighborly things and didn't want to be recognized for it. On May 5th, 2015, Aaron and I decided to take Chris to the zoo. When we get back from the zoo late that afternoon, we discovered that my front door was cracked open. Ugh. Now my front door did have a deadbolt, but I must have forgotten to lock it. How freaking stupid of me. You can imagine how upset I was due to my back door being tampered with multiple times back in February. I just didn't understand why this was happening again. Like all the other times, nothing was taken. My belongings seemed untouched. Yes, I was feeling targeted, but I didn't call the police because I felt like I technically had nothing to report. There was nothing stolen or vandalized, just an open front door. So I let it go. Two days later, I would discover the depth of things. May 7th, 2015. It was one of my rare days off. I was at home relaxing when the diner called me. I answered thinking maybe my boss wanted me to come into work. It wasn't my boss, but my co-worker, Celia. She stated that somebody named Mary called the diner asking to speak to me. Mary had asked for me by name. Since I wasn't at work that day, Mary left her phone number and requested that I call her as soon as possible. I thanked Celia for relaying the message and ended the call perplexed. I didn't know who Mary was, but out of curiosity I gave her a call. Mary ended up being Ryan's estranged wife. I didn't even know he was married. She informed me that Ryan had a nervous breakdown while they were arguing. He stated a raving like a wild man about how I was a better girlfriend than she is a wife. He told her that we were in love and that he had been taking care of me and my Down Syndrome son for months. My son doesn't even have Down Syndrome by the way. My son is not mentally impaired. She initially thought that it was just all crazy talk considering his mental state. He mentioned where I worked. He said we were going to get married. He then said that I had asked him to adopt my son. He said that he was going to run away with me in order to get away from her. He even told her he started visiting me after following me home one day. When he said that, Mary knew that something was very wrong. Ryan had somewhat of a history with mental issues, and Mary was used to him weaponizing things to hurt her feelings during arguments, even if those things are lies. But she said this time was different. She knew he had started frequenting the diner, and red flags went way up for her when he admitted to following someone home, so she decided to call the diner to see if anyone by my name worked there. When Celia confirmed this, Mary perceived the possible danger, and she left me her name and number requesting a callback. My head was spinning at this point. While things were finally starting to make sense, I was still gobsmacked. At one point in the conversation, Mary mentioned my grasping mode. Yes, Ryan even flaunted the yard work he did for me in her face. It was all very strange and very surreal. Basically, Ryan had been obsessing over me for months. He became delusional and had created a whole relationship between me and him in his mind. It was all in his head. And obviously, he was the one that was breaking into my home when I was gone, aka the visits. Why he did it, I still haven't pieced that 100% together. He never took anything. I imagine he was mowing my grass because that was his little way of taking care of me. But anyway, by the end of the phone call, I decided to go to the police department in person to file a report about Ryan. I thought at the very least this is harassment and I needed it documented. Maybe I could get a restraining order. Mary offered to provide an official statement to the police as well, to which I thanked her profusely for it. The police department took our statements, and the harassment complaint was filed. Although I couldn't get a PO based off my statement alone, I had no hard proof. The officer did assure me that he would personally go talk to Ryan. I then went straight to the diner to inform my boss Chase of the situation. Now Chase took this very seriously. Just that morning, a third shift waitress actually brought up to Chase how a man came into the diner very early, around 4 in the morning. 
This man was trying to get her to tell him which days I'd be working that week. She told Chase it made her uncomfortable. So when I told Chase about Ryan, he went back and looked at the cameras from that morning. And sure enough, the man that was bothering Third Shift for information about me was Ryan. So Chase initiated the process through corporate to get a permanent ban on Ryan from the diner. It was approved at a later date. I was scheduled to work the following day and I was nervous throughout my entire shift, but thankfully Ryan didn't show up, nor did he show up the following day, or the next day after that. All was quiet at my home as well, but the officer showing up at Ryan's house to speak with him must have spoken to him enough to stop this. Weeks, then months went by. No Ryan in sight, no vandalism at my home, no mysteriously mown grass, nothing. My life had gone completely back to normal. But things changed again in October. October 5th, 2015. It was around 8 p.m. My son Chris fell asleep on the couch while watching a movie. I had dozed off as well until I heard a few very light knocks at my front door. I then walked to the kitchen and looked out the only window that faces my driveway. No cars there except my own. So I figured the light tapping I heard at my door was either just the television or my half-asleep brain playing tricks on me. I then returned to the couch and started playing a game on my phone. About five minutes later, I heard a few light knocks on my door again. This time, I was wide awake, so I knew my brain wasn't playing tricks on me. So I walked back over to my kitchen window to double-check the driveway to see who was there. Again, my car was the only one in the driveway. Right as I go to close the kitchen window blinds, a loud knocking suddenly erupts at my front door, and I mean loud, angry banging. I guess my instincts kicked in, and I sprinted to the couch. I scooped Chris up into my arms and ran down the hallway to his bedroom. I did the only thing I could think of in that fraction of a moment. He was groggy and confused, but he listened to my instructions. Get under your bed, stay under your bed, and don't come out until I tell you to. I then ran to my kitchen and grabbed a knife while dialing 911. I actually screamed at the door that I was calling the cops, just in hopes that it would scare them away. I then positioned myself at the end of the hallway, which connects my son's room to the living room. This way, I'd have a clear view of both the front door in front of me and my son's bedroom doorway behind me. As the operator picked up my call, the banging on my front door was getting even louder. 911 said she was dispatching police right away. She instructed me to stay on the phone line until they arrived. About 12 minutes into the call, the banging got more violent, rattling pictures off the wall. I thought for sure that they would break my door down at any moment. 911 asked me where I was located in the home, and I told her. She asked me if I could hide somewhere. She told me not to put myself in any sort of danger. In that tiny moment, I felt enraged. No, I'm not going to hide. I'm not taking my eyes off my son's bedroom under any circumstance. Where are the cops? And besides, I lived in a small trailer and the only hiding place for an adult is my bedroom closet. I'd easily be found. So I just erupted over the phone. Look, lady, I'm a single mom. I have no man, no gun, and no place to hide. If he breaks this door down, what am I supposed to do? Throw this knife at him? Where are the cops? She assured me again that the cops were on their way and to stay on the line. More banging, but this time it moved to the actual side of the trailer. It sounded like they were taking a baseball bat and beating it against the outside of the trailer. At that moment, Chris started shrieking. I ran the few steps over into his room to check on him. The loud commotion had just pushed his fear over the edge. He was screaming and crying under his bed. I quickly ascertained that he was physically okay, and I returned back to the end of the hallway to check on the front door. As I was explaining to 911 that my son was okay, just scared, I noticed that the banging had suddenly stopped. I waited for another minute or so, trying to listen out for any sign of further escalation, like window breaking. All I could hear were sobs coming from my son's room. 
All in all, it took the cops 23 minutes to arrive to my trailer. By then, the perpetrator was long gone. For reference, I live about 10 minutes away from the police station. 911 even called it as an active home invasion. I was livid about the response time. My front door was made out of some type of metal, just a cheap generic trailer door. It was now covered in dents. There were even noticeable scratch marks on the lock. Failed attempts at picking the deadbolt. The siding on the trailer was damaged where the perpetrator had hit it with something. Now, given the history, I immediately suspected Ryan was the perpetrator. The police said since I didn't actually see the person, then they couldn't arrest him without any eyewitness. The most they could do was make a report. They did end up canvassing the immediate area in case he was on foot, since I didn't see a vehicle in my driveway prior to this happening. However, there was no sign of him or anyone around and about. I deduced that he probably had parked nearby at his site, that way his vehicle wouldn't be spotted or recognized at my home. My home was situated next to a thin patch of woods that has public access roads on the other side. I also am absolutely convinced that Ryan had nefarious plans for me that evening, but when he discovered my son was at home with me, via his terrified shrieking, he bailed. He stopped trying to break into my home the moment my son inadvertently made his presence known. For whatever reason, Ryan always lit up when I talked about my son. He used to initiate conversations about Chris just to watch me dote over him. Looking back, I guess it was his morbid way of bonding with my child, and I think in his own warped way, he grew to care about him. So when he heard Chris screaming, he decided not to follow through with whatever plans he had for me. I ended up taking a few days off of work because I was so shaken up. I stayed at my parents' house during that time because I was afraid to go home. My landlord had the damaged door replaced while I was gone. Realizing that I had a job and a life and that I couldn't stay gone forever. But I knew I had to go home. So I got a gun, a small caliber revolver, but it would do the job. And then I went home. I lived in that trailer for another four months before I saved up enough money to move. It was totally peaceful during these months with no further events or altercations whatsoever. But I just couldn't stand being there anymore. Since then, I've changed jobs, met someone special, gotten engaged, bought a house, and got a dog. No further sign of Ryan anywhere during any of these life changes. It's now been nearly seven years since any signs of him. Ryan seems to have disappeared out of my life, just in the same manner that he first appeared, out of nowhere. And I couldn't be happier that he's gone. Hopefully, it remains that way. This happened a few years ago now, so I live alone with my two cats. We live in a flat, but the front door is on the street level. So when you open the door, you go up the stairs and you're already inside the flat. I don't have a garden either. Now I'm in my mid-thirties, female, very small, petite, and lucky enough to still look young. I still get ID'd for cigarettes and alcohol. I also smoke outside by the front door as I don't like smoking inside. Yeah, even when it's raining. I don't live in a rough part of town, so it's fairly usual to say hello to people walking by you. They're used to seeing me smoking outside, so we often exchange greetings. People regularly use this area as a shortcut. My last cigarette is around 11.30 before I go to bed. Of course, when it's really dark. It can feel unnerving, but as I said, it is a nice area. But with that said, my flat is the only one of two in this area. It's not the best looking. The rest are houses, beautiful houses, pretty decoration, nice cars, pretty flowers, etc. Basically richer and a lot nicer than mine. I am pretty poor, and you can tell. For a few weeks before this incident, I kept hearing my front door handle moving, as though someone had tried to open it. I put it down to kids walking to school. Then it'd be in the middle of the day, then the evening, 
but each time I got to the bottom of the stairs, nobody was around. This one night, I went for my last cigarette, 1130, got ready and went to bed, and I fell asleep quickly. At one point, I woke up slightly because I heard the cats playing. I rolled over and went back to sleep. They woke me up again. I could still hear them playing, but I also heard them growling. While they were laying in bed next to me, I sat bolt upright, and I realized the sounds were coming from the front door. The cats were still growling. I snuck into the hallway and peered down the stairs. I could see the front door handle was now turning, and for the first time in my life, my brain thought faster than my mouth, and I switched the stair lights on. There was a pause with my door open a few inches, then I heard feet running away. I ran down the stairs and slammed the door shut again, then back up the stairs to call the police. This was around 1am. They finally came out at 5am. I didn't sleep. I sat in a chair watching the stairs all night, absolutely terrified whoever was out there would come back. I didn't even go for a cigarette, even though I desperately wanted one, because I was too afraid that they'd be waiting. The police showed me how they got in. They damaged the door frame, and the, I don't know what it's called, that bit of material slash plastic that seals along the door, that was all cut slash ripped up. I ended up calling my landlord first thing in the morning and had deadbolts fitted. I'm now overly cautious when I smoke. I don't stay in one place anymore. I go for a little walk each time. I also don't stick to the same timings either, and I definitely will listen to the cats better. If they're growling, there's a reason for it. I'm just so glad that they growled that night. If they hadn't, I'd have ignored it and gone back to sleep again. Then, I would have woken up to someone in my house doing who knows what, and for who knows why reasons. The house I grew up in was very large, with my bedroom being at the front of the house by the street and my parents all the way down the other end. The garage was next to my room with a window looking in and I would keep this blind up to help me wake up in the morning. My bed was then against the other window which faced the street. This story happened when I was 16 or 17 and I'm a girl and I don't have any siblings if that's important at all. As a teenager, I tended to stay up quite late, cruising my space and chatting to my friends on MSN. One night, I was sitting in bed doing so. It was around 4 in the morning, when I heard distinctively human snoring coming from the other side of my window. I quickly ran down the other end of the house and woke up my parents. Dad went to investigate and said it must have been a possum or koala as there was nothing there. The next night it's a similar thing for me, stayed up late, except this time I turned off all my lights and was just laying in bed listening to music very softly. About an hour later, I hear a bang right outside my bedroom window. Now after the night before, dad was grumpy enough at me for waking him up. I laid there for a few seconds longer contemplating what to do, as I knew he'd be angry at being woken up a second night in a row, before I said, screw it, and legged it down to my parents' room. Dad wasn't having a bar of it this time, so mom said she'd walk me back to my room. Upon getting to my room, the light in the garage was now on. Remember, I keep this blind up, and I swore to mom that it was off before. She went and got dad who went to investigate and found the roller door up. As he walked towards it, it started closing. He thought the electricals must have been glitching as it was a bit stormy and we all went back to bed. The next morning, mom woke me up to apologize. Someone had smashed our car window open and stolen the roller door remote. We never kept the house door on the other side of the roller door locked and they shut the roller on dad so they could get away. I always think about, had I stayed in my room any longer and heard the door going up, and seen the person walk past my window, what would I have done, as there was no way I'd be able to get to my parents' room in time? To break in in the middle of the night, knowing full well that everybody was home, still gives me chills over what could have happened. My parents then went away for the weekend, leaving me on my own. 
I slept the next few nights in the room with the door locked, my hockey stick, every knife in the house, and the house phone next to me. Not a lot of sleeping happened though. In 2017, I was an undergrad, living with three other students in a rough student house in a big city. For context on the layout of the house, this will be beneficial for the story. My bedroom was the only one on the ground floor beside the front door and opposite the kitchen. We only had a front door and front windows, no back door. My bed was in the middle of the room. The bottom of the bed was facing the bedroom door. There were three floors in total, two bedrooms on the second floor, and another bedroom and sitting room on the third floor. One June evening, we all decided to head out with a few other friends who came around for pre-drinks for a big drunken night out in town to simultaneously celebrate end of exams, my 21st birthday, and one big last hurrah before everyone went back home or went traveling for the summer. I'm not a huge clubber, so me and my then boyfriend were ready to go home at around 1 to 1.30 a.m. We hitched an Uber back, drunkenly got a takeaway, and passed out in bed around 2 to 2.30 a.m. At 4.30 a.m., we were both jolted awake by one of my housemates slamming open the door with, We've been robbed. We rubbed our eyes in bewilderment as neither of us had woken up and thought she was playing some horrible prank. Surely, given our proximity to the front door, we would have heard something. We walked up the stairs to discover the upstairs rooms were largely ransacked and items missing. Everyone's electricals that weren't on them were gone, like laptops, iPads, cameras, passports were gone, and my housemate's weed stash was taken. A baseball cap from the girl whose room was on the third floor was found in another person's bedroom on the second floor, meaning the intruder wore the cap and took it off as he slash they proceeded through the house. It then hit me. What about my room? I raced downstairs to check my belongings and discovered that my handbag at the bottom of the bed was missing and my ex's phone and wallet that were also at the bottom of the bed was taken. My laptop was on the bedside table beside me and was untouched. The intruder, or intruders, managed to break open the front door, go through the entire house, ransack rooms looking for things to steal, and actually open the door of the bedroom we were sleeping in to take things right in front of the bed that we were in, and we never woke up to any of it. To say I was shook when I found out what happened was an absolute understatement. The police came to take our statements and file a report, but nothing ever came of it. To this day, I'm still super uneasy to go to bed in an empty house after that night. I am forever thankful that we never woke up in the middle of the robbery or that I went home alone that night because the outcome could have been very different. This happened to me about two years ago when I was 17 years old. My family went out for the day to go shopping for food and I stayed home alone. I was in my room playing video games on my PC with my headphones on and I always keep my door closed. So after about an hour, I get up to go use the bathroom. Both the bathroom and my room are on the second floor and our house at the time was a two-story detached house in West Belfast, Northern Ireland. So when I get back to my room, I remember closing the door and getting back to playing video games and about 30 minutes went by and I go to check my phone, but I realize I left it in the bathroom. I get up to go get it and notice my door is open slightly ajar. Now here's the thing, my house isn't drafty whatsoever and I know the door is good and it doesn't just open due to the wind or whatever. So it catches me off guard, but I reason that I probably just didn't close it all the way and head out to get my phone. I come back and continue playing video games, making sure I close the door on my way back in. Some time later, I hear my family come back home. I hear them bringing the first load of shopping into the kitchen and go out to the car to get more. When they come back in, they call my name and I head downstairs. When I came downstairs, I saw that the back patio door was wide open. 
My family asked me if I had been out there while they were gone, and I told them that I hadn't been. We looked outside and saw one of the deck chairs was pulled over to a lower part of the fence, facing a small area of woodland leading into another street, obviously not where it should be. This shocked me. My mind raced with ideas of what the heck was going on. This is my own personal theory. Somebody had managed to get in, most likely through the back door. They went to see if the house was clear, went upstairs, opened my door, and saw me. Then, they must have decided to wait downstairs for some reason, maybe thinking I would leave or they could ambush me. But then they had gotten scared and hid when my family returned, using the fact that they had left the kitchen to go bring in more shopping to slip out as fast as they could and use the chair to get over the fence. Even with this idea, I don't understand why they would risk coming in, given that it was in the middle of the day. Plus, if they had seen I had headphones on, why not just come up behind me and deal with me then? The worst thing about it is if I had no concrete proof of what happened that day, I have no idea why someone came in, how they got in, who they were, but one thing I feel certain is that somebody did come into my house that day. There is more to this story though. A week or so later. It's late at night, around 2 in the morning, and I'm in my room playing video games again. While playing, I ended up drifting off to sleep, and I was awoken by my mom coming in, shaking me and asking me if I was outside. I told her no, I have been here all night, and I fell asleep. My mother proceeds to explain to me that while she was laying in bed, she heard the back door slap open, and as her room was just above the kitchen in the back door, she felt the shake of the slam. My stepdad was working the night shift at the time, so it was only me, my mom, and sister in the house. I go downstairs to check to see if everything's okay. The door is wide open. Our back garden was in pitch black darkness, so not knowing if anyone was out there, I closed and locked the door. I looked around the garden from the inside with a torch. I don't see anyone outside and decide to stay downstairs for a few hours, keeping a lookout. The next day, we changed the locks. The strange thing about both of these instances is that nothing was stolen, none of our things were missing, and it seemed that nothing had been really moved or any drawers looked through. I have absolutely no explanation for this, and to this day, it still baffles my mind. We had discussed getting the police involved, but we felt that because there was no serious evidence of a crime taking place, and that we would be moving out of the house in a matter of weeks, unrelated to all of this, we decided there wouldn't really be anything that they could do to help us. So we just had our locks changed, and made absolutely sure to keep things locked and watched until we had moved out. If anybody has any ideas of what had actually happened, please feel free to get in touch as I have absolutely no idea what to make of any of this. So my husband, Ted, is in the military. We've generally lived on base every station we've been to because the surrounding towns can be very crime ridden and sketchy and with my husband gone most of the time, the extra security is appreciated. I work from home due to us moving so often. So one afternoon I was taking a break, I'd made a bite to eat and was snuggling on the couch with my dog. That's when I heard the sliding glass door open. It was so nonchalant, I thought it was Ted. I saw my cat run from the kitchen and a shadow standing near the door entering it. I thought maybe he'd come back for something. So I called out for him and was like, what are you doing home? Did you forget something? No answer. This is where I just got an eerie feeling. After I asked what he was doing, I saw the shadow move and heard the click of the sliding door lock. From there, he walked to the laundry room and shut the door. I still had received no response. So I'm sitting on the couch scared out of my mind and I call my husband hoping to hear his phone in the laundry room. I don't hear a ring, but he answers. I asked him why he came home and didn't answer me, and all he says is, that wasn't me. Grab the dog and get in your car. I freaked out. After getting off the phone with Ted, I grab the dog and run to my car. 
From there, I call the military police. Waiting for them was probably the longest 20 minutes of my life. When they got there, they cleared the house and found no one. They asked me to make a statement, and even they were baffled that somebody would try this on a base. We still live here, and I'm so scared. He's going to come back. When I was 11 years old, my grandma had a friend from work who always gave me a weird vibe. He would show up to my house right after my grandma and him got off of work. Now he lived in a different city than me so he would have to make two trips to go home. When he showed up, he would watch my grandma sleep for like 5 minutes before waking her up. The reason I would let him in is because my grandma half asleep would just say, let him in. Then she would fall asleep again. My grandma would leave the bathroom door open when she changed out of her uniform because I would be in my room when she got home or on the couch watching TV. So sometimes, my grandma's friend would come in and go to the bathroom. He was kinda weird. The main event happened when I had family out of state coming to my hometown, but they were staying at my Aunt Linda's house. My Aunt Candace, from out of state, wanted to go fishing with my grandma. So I was home alone because they left early in the morning and I didn't feel like getting up to fish, mainly because I hate fishing. So at about 12.30, my grandma's friend showed up and doesn't leave when my grandma's car is gone. So then I just think he's being weird and he's going to leave. I was sitting on the couch watching TV and then I hear a loud bang. I lived next to a highway so I thought nothing of it. But then it happened again. I see my dogs run to the laundry room which leads to the basement and back door. I go outside to see what's happening and I see the back door that's supposed to be nailed shut. It's now wide open. Being a child, I start to run to the front yard. Then I see my grandma's friend isn't in his car. I then call my cousin and she and her kid who is also my cousin come over. They jump out of the car and run to the backyard. Now it's important to know my cousin is an adult and worked with my grandma. So when she goes to the backyard, she sees him just casually walking out of my house. She says, George, why are you here? He looks startled to see her. Then he says, oh, I had to use the bathroom, which made no sense because of the other excuses he used. Then my cousin followed my grandma's friend to his car. We looked at what he did. He took off the nails that nailed the door shut. Then he buzzed the bottom panel to the second door open. I assume that was the first loud bang I heard. Then he went up the stairs to go to the laundry room door. He tried to bust it down, so I think that was the second loud bang. When he was leaving, he was giving up or going to his car to get something to make it easier. So I called my grandma, and she went to my Aunt Linda's house, which is where I went to after he broke into my house. She stopped being friends and never spoke to him again. My theories are the following. 1. He heard I had family from out of state, so he thought I was with my grandma, so he thought nobody was going to be home. 2. He broke in to try to steal pills from my grandma. 3. Because of the other weird things he did like watching my grandmother sleep, I think he was trying to steal her used bra or panties. But anyway, that's my story. Also, stop being friends with someone if your kid says they watch you sleep. Okay, so bear with me. This happened when I was a kid and I double checked the story with my family. So this was in the mid 80s. I was about 7 at home with two of my older sisters, 8 years old and 11 years old and two cousins, 7 and 8 years old all five girls. My sister, 11, was in charge of babysitting us four younger girls. You have to picture what her house looked like in order to understand what happened. It was a two-story box house with a flat roof and a small box front porch, also with a flat roof. I can't remember what we were doing but we were all inside the house. We kept hearing noises coming from the roof like walking and what sounded like rocks being dropped down the downspouts. You know, kids, we thought of a squirrel or something, but it kept happening. 
Then my older sister said something about how maybe somebody had climbed the huge tree beside the house and got on the roof. We were all scared because we knew there was a roof access point in the bedroom that I shared with one of my sisters. What if he could get inside? My oldest sister told my other sister and one of the other cousins to walk across the street to the corner store, across an empty gravel parking lot, and on the way back, look up and see if they could see somebody on the roof. So the girls, both eight years old, walk halfway across the parking lot and being curious kids, turned around, looked up, and saw a guy in one of those totally 80s guys crop top football jerseys. Think Johnny Depp in A Nightmare on Elm Street. He was crouched down on the roof. The girls came running home, freaking out, and told my older sister about the guy. My older sister, freaking out, first went to the neighbor's house to use their deck to see if she could see on her roof but couldn't see anything. She came home and then called the police. It felt like it took them ages to show up. When they got there, I don't think they believed a word we said. They thought a bunch of little kids are making up this story for attention. One cop drove down the road, up a hill about a block away, to see if they could see anything. But the way the roof was, you couldn't see a person if they were laying. Then these cops tell us kids that we had to go upstairs and check everywhere to see if we found anyone. Five little girls, from ages 7 to 11, sent upstairs, scared out of their minds, crying to look for this man, knowing about the roof access. We all cried not wanting to go, but they said we had to. To this day, I remember how scared I was. I remember looking, but how well do little kids look, right? The cops didn't listen to us, didn't check out the house, inside or out, and left. We were so scared to be left home with the guy out there, who knows where. We didn't know if he was just laying down on the roof or jumped down or somehow got in and was hiding. My mom finally got home a few hours later and we told her what happened and my mom explained to us that there was a lock on the roof access and nobody could get in but she checked anyway. Then went to check out the outside. There were clear footprints in the dirt dug and good from him jumping off the roof, onto the porch, and off into the flower bed. My mom was so steaming mad when she realized we told the truth and we weren't believed by the police. We went to the police station the next day and were all separated and interviewed. We all told the same story. My mom went up one side of the cops and down the other, but we never found out who the guy was or why he was there. Did he know it was a house with five little girls, home alone? Who knows? It was a time between the afternoon and the evening, where in the winter, the sun set earlier than usual. At the time, I was probably around 10 years old, so I was a little girl. I had been accustomed to being alone by myself, even since I was younger and my parents had work. By this time, I knew the rules of making sure the doors are locked, never to talk to strangers, how to cook basic food items, and blah blah blah. So I thought, I was pretty much set because I've done being home alone basically forever. However, that really wasn't the case. I'm usually on my computer a lot, and it's smack dab in the middle of the first floor, so I can primarily see everything. And to add on, it was in front of the staircase that led up to the second floor, and directly on top of the staircase is a bathroom. Directly behind me where I sat are these two large windows. Mistakenly, I had left the curtains open, and of course, outside it was dark, and of course my back was facing the windows. So if anyone wanted to look in, they could pretty much stalk me, and I wouldn't know. But yeah, in the position of the space I was in, I could see a lot of exits and doors around me. So I could hear a lot, and I could see a lot too. This night wasn't any different. I was on my computer. Now, I've always had an interest in weird, morbid, paranormal slash creepy stories that I've read online, and I've had my fair taste of experiencing such things. Even now, I love reading stories like that. I mean, part of me is like, the more you read like that, 
the more open you are to experiencing that and letting things in like that. And then there's just the part of me that's like, there's an us, but there's a them. Whatever happens to some random person online or them won't happen to us because that seems too out there or too disconnected to us. And that last part was BS. I tell you this, it was. So I'm on my computer. The only available light in the entire house is this lamp that's to the right of me and the light of my computer. I'm listening to music, chilling out, doing my thing. But over the music, I hear a noise. My eyes immediately dart to the top of the staircase. I sit still for a moment. I pause the music, and I wonder what the heck was that. I look to the hallways and rooms on the first floor where the dim light of the lamp barely touches. Sitting in the silence, waiting to check if it was nothing, or if it was something was really weird. I mean, this blanket of paranoia just went over me. Then, I looked at the top of the staircase again, where the bathroom was. Was the bathroom door closed? Or open? I had thought it was open at first, but it was closed. Suddenly, I just knew. My mind had picked up on an image of some dark figure walking into the bathroom from a room I couldn't see and closing it. That's what my peripheral vision had seen, and that's what my ears had heard. I just brushed it off, because I see paranormal figures sometimes, and I thought it was nothing. But this time, the noise, the moment it happened, had been clear. I knew. So I stood still for a few moments. Then I decided to check out the noise of the bathroom. I got up from the desk and slowly began to creep up the stairs, holding on the wooden railing. Yeah, if I was in a horror movie, I was probably the stupid character and that would be how I die because you never check out the creepy thing because, again, that's how you die. But I decided to anyway. I was 10. As I'm creeping up the stairs, this feeling of dread and terror just shoot me. I'm sure at the time my instincts were telling me to get out of there, to not be there, but I digress. I ignore my feelings and I'm on the last step. My hands are clinging to the railing and guess what I said out loud. I asked to whatever it was, who's there? My eyes are glued to the closed door of the bathroom. I know it was probably how I died, to be honest. I shouldn't have been on the stairs in the first place. I think at the time, I was more willing to chalk it up to paranormal things instead of real life creepy things. So I didn't really think about it. I was more curious than scared. As the question dangles in the air, who's there? I hear the doorknob move. And as the door opens, this shot of even more terror and paranoia pump through me. My eyes just go wild. That was probably the most I've been scared in my life. And what came out of the bathroom was my dad. Yeah, my dad. Apparently he had been home the entire time. He had literally slept the entire day. And when he woke up, he was dressed in this black bathrobe. So that explained why he looked like a dark scary figure. And he literally had used the bathroom in the dark. So the lights of the bathroom were of course off. So that was why I hadn't noticed that rationally. It wasn't a ghost. I literally yelled, You gave me a heart attack. Bottom line, while I might have died, I learned not to do what I did, and that I'm sort of brave, and you should listen to the clues that your mind picks up on, because it will alert you to things that seem way off. Really, while that story had a happy slash safe ending, I've had other way more actual dangerous creepy things happen to me, but that's another tale for another time. I recall this story after my speech class had an assignment where we basically told our random stories to each other. I previously had thought nothing noteworthy has happened to me, but this story of my youth came back to me, and I hope you guys like this happy slash creepy story of mine. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the Creepy Fox Podcast. If this is the first time you've joined us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads coming here to the Creepy Fox. Also, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like rating and a comment down below telling me what you all thought. And make sure to pick up some Creepy Fox merchandise if you like. That's available right below the video player. 
Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you to all our channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Medu Saltil, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Corey, and Sylvia. Thank you, of course, to all the regular viewers who constantly tune in and listen to the videos and share them with family and friends. It really does go a long way to help out the Creepy Fox family grow. Speaking of that, if you'd like to go ahead and share your own story for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen, that's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. As you saw today, we did go ahead and feature some stories from Reddit. I have discussed this in the past, and because I want to go ahead and give you guys more videos without you having to wait forever for new uploads, I'll be going ahead and including stories from Reddit, along with the scary stories that subscribers send. Thank you for understanding. So, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care, and have yourself an amazing day.